Welcome back to our study through the Gospel of Mark. We're still in chapter 13 this week. If you joined us last time, we began chapter 13 and worked through the first several verses there. Tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at the part where Jesus launches into describing His return, His second coming. If you can remember, back at the beginning of chapter 13 and verse 4, His disciples had come to Him and they were asking Him, Uh, When will these things happen, referring to the end of this age? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to take place? Matthew gives us the addition here, and what will be the sign of your coming? So last week we talked about a number of those signs that Jesus went on to list at the beginning of chapter 13. Tonight what we're going to be talking about is the answer to this second question. What will be the sign of your coming? Jesus is going to go on to give in his own words some of the details about what his second coming looks like and what we can expect. And really what we're going to do is I've tried to break this down into multiple sections where we can look at the kind of a preview of his second coming, um, the place of his second coming, the people of his second coming, and uh, the purpose of his second coming. So hopefully as we go through this, that will help make it a little bit easier to digest as we work through it. The second coming is a pretty important event in the Bible's timeline of human history happening right at the very end, and uh, there's quite a bit of information that's shared about that. Every New Testament book mentions the second coming, with the exceptions of the three smallest, Philemon, 2nd, and 3rd John, and even in Philemon, it's alluded to, uh, although he doesn't explicitly mention it. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament, and to put this in as a frame of reference for us, there are over 300 references to this event that we're going to study tonight. Jesus directs his followers to be ready for his return over 50 times. And when we see something repeated in Scripture, an emphasis time and again, these things being mentioned, it should draw our attention to it because Jesus thought it was important enough to repeat so many times. Now, Christians for the last 2,000 years have been awaiting this event from the moment that Jesus ascends into heaven in the very beginning of the book of Acts. His followers have been waiting for his return. There's a tremendous amount of hope that is placed on Jesus coming back and rescuing his people. In 2 Peter, Peter mentions this. Above all, understand this. In the last days... Blatant scoffers will come, being propelled by their own evil urges and saying, Where is his promised return? For ever since our ancestors died, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. And so this is nothing new. In Peter's day, in the first century, people were already starting to come out, scoffing at this idea. When is his return going to come? How? You know, and they had only been waiting a few years, maybe a couple decades at this point. We're, we're way past that. And so, uh, yes, there were scoffers in his day, and there will be all the way up until the last days. We will hear this repeatedly. Oh, yeah, he's supposed to come back. Well, when is that going to be? Well, let's kind of look at, in our passage, we're given a bit of a preview of his return. So Jesus earlier had listed all of, you know, a number of signs that will portend or will foreshadow his second coming. But here in this, he gives us another little preview of what will happen. We read in verse 24 of Mark 13. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And so here we're given uh, this. This is kind of like the... The, the preview before a movie. When you're watching a trailer, you know that the movie's about to start. Jesus gives us this indication, okay, there's going to be celestial issues. There's, there's going to be things going on with, with the environment, with the earth, with, with the stars and the sky. In Luke 24, Luke gives us this added detail. He said, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and on the earth nations will be in distress, anxious over the roaring of the sea and the surging of waves. People will be fainting from fear and from the expectation of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This will be a dramatic 
period of time in human history where the, the whole world will know that something terrible, something incredible, something dramatic is going on. We read in Isaiah, so going all the way back into the Old Testament now, we have these Old Testament authors uh, speaking for God, God giving them insight as to what this day would be. We read in Isaiah 13, Indeed, the stars in the sky and their constellations no longer give out their light. The sun is darkened as soon as it rises and the moon does not shine. So we see a, a, a pattern here, the, the idea that there will be some major things going on as we look up into the sky. In Joel chapter 2, another passage about this event, we read that the earth quakes before them. The sky reverberates. The sun and the moon grow dark. The stars refuse to shine. So again and again, we're given this kind of description of this celestial chaos happening. The question for us, though, is when will all this happen, right? We talked last week about the signs that as, you know, Jesus described them as birth pains, that as you get closer and closer to the end, these dramatic worldwide events will happen in greater and greater frequency. But that still leaves us with this question of when will this happen? Well, over the centuries, many uh, teachers and, and, and Christians have tried to guess this time and this date. Unfortunately, when they end up setting these dates, they end up just making themselves look like fools and making a fool out of the Bible. Notice what Jesus says here in verse 24. He tells us in those days after that tribulation. So tribul another way to translate this word for tribulation is suffering or the great suffering. Jesus is saying, okay, in chapter 13, there are going to be these signs that you'll see that will continue to increase as we get closer to the end. And then after that time, that's when you can expect my return. So if we were to look at a timeline, this may help visually give us an idea of these events that Jesus has been giving to us. We can start back at the cross when Jesus was crucified in 33 AD. Following his death and then subsequent resurrection and ascension into heaven, we see that Jesus had sent out his followers to begin the church, something that's come to be known as the church age, the time period of time we're in right now. Now, where are we in this timeline? I can't say. I would imagine we'd be somewhere close, closer to the end, perhaps, although I can't say for sure, but we do know that we're still in this church age. Because the end of this period of time where God is working through his body, the body of Christ, the Christian church around the world, that will end dramatically at this moment in time where Jesus will call down from the clouds and rescue his followers off the face of the earth. This rescue event many times is called the rapture of the church, which will bring an end to this church age. And subsequently, it will bring in immediately following this time of great suffering, this great tribulation, as we read in our passage here tonight. But remember what Jesus says there. After those days, those days being those tribulation days, at the end of that time is when he will return. And so to make this as simple as I possibly can, this is essentially the period of time that we have been talking about here from the time of the tribulation to his return here in chapter 13. Well, what about some of these folks throughout history who have tried setting that date for his return? We read from Bible uh, theologian David Jeremiah. Back in 1843, for example, a New Englander named William Miller came to ardently believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, he began to speculate about the date of that return using some dubious mathematical calculations. He collected mounds of data, analyzed it, and was certain he had made no mistakes. He therefore confidently announced to his followers that on March 21st, 1843, Jesus Christ would return to the earth. Well, that day has come and gone long since. We know that didn't happen. He continues at midnight on the appointed day. His devoted followers donned their ascension robes. I don't know what that is about. They trekked into the mountains and climbed towering trees to get as high as possible so they would have less distance to travel through the air when the Lord returned to take them home. What a, what a fascinating idea. But the day came and went, 
the Lord did not return and the trees became awfully uncomfortable. Yeah, how long were they going to sit up there in those trees? It didn't work. Again, this date setting, this idea that we could somehow calculate from Scripture the day that Jesus returns. And this is nothing, you know, uh, this didn't just happen a uh, hundred years ago. This is happening all the way up into our very day. Some of you may remember back in 2011, these billboards plastered all around the city saying, Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011. The man who was propagating this, uh, you know, he went as far to say the Bible guarantees it. What a crock, what a joke, making a mockery of Scripture. When what we read in Scripture is that that is ridiculous. Jesus never calls on us to set the date for his uh, arrival. And as a matter of fact, since we don't know when the church will be rescued, the Bible gives us no indication of when that may be. Many call it an imminent event, meaning nothing needs to precede that rescue. Since we don't know when that is, we can't figure out, it is impossible for us to know or reckon when his second coming will be. We just don't know when those days of great suffering will actually come upon the world. And so we need to avoid these extremes as readers of the Bible. For one, we need to view the world events in light of biblical truth not the other way around. In other words, we don't fall into the trap of what some call newspaper exegesis, where we look at a newspaper and try and fit these things that, that we're reading about in the news and place them into events that we read about in Scripture. That's the wrong way to do it. Instead, we need to know and study the Word of God, know what it says. And then from there, if something is going on in the world, we could say, okay, does that line up with what we see here in Scripture? In other words, we need to know the biblical truth of first importance. Secondly, we need to reject date setting outright. It's sinful. It's wrong. Jesus specifically tells us to not uh, uh, do this, this kind of thing and that we cannot know the day that he, of his return. We never want to focus on the future at the expense of the present. If we became so obsessive, so um, enamored with figuring out the dates and T doing newspaper exegesis, trying to fit every little thing going on in our world news into the pages of the Bible, we're totally going to lose sight of the commission that Jesus has sent us on right now as followers of Christ. Our first priority should be to be found faithful with what Jesus has commissioned or has sent his church, his followers on to do, which is to reach the world with this incredible gospel, this incredible news that Jesus has come to save and forgive us our sins, and that he wants us to grow in our lives closer and closer to him so that we can spread the love of Christ throughout the world. But when we get so focused on these future things, it, it can really be at the expense of the presence. We want to reject that. We live our lives in light of our eternal destiny. One of the great and incredible things about being a follower of Christ is realizing that we can know where we're headed. We can know that Jesus has promised us new life, eternity, new bodies. He has promised to wipe away every tear, to lift the curse, to welcome us into our eternal homes with him in heaven. And so we live our lives with this underlying foundational level of hope, a guarantee of God's promises to us. And so we live our lives in light of that destiny. We should avoid scoffing. We should avoid uh, any sort of speculation. You know, many times people will say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to speculate about the end times. I'm not going to be interested in these future events because we can't know anything about it. I think that's taking it a little bit too far. I think that's, that's the opposite extreme to the date setting. Jesus does want us to know about these things. There's a reason he spent so much time explaining them to us. So we should avoid the scoffing kind of negative attitude. Well, for, forget about it. It's not important. We should humbly allow for corrections after further reflection. Many times we'll come across something in Scripture or we'll listen to a teaching and we may become convinced that this is how things are going to happen. I think that it's fine for us to become convinced of truth in the Bible. But I think we also need to allow for a humble perception of perhaps further reflection or further study 
will reveal uh, an uh, something new to us or re reveal a, a different way of understanding a passage. And without the humility to sit under the authority of God's word, what we're doing is really standing over it in judgment, saying this means this and so on and so forth. We need to let the word have its proper place in our lives, speaking the truth to us rather than us to the word. And finally, we need to understand the difference between negotiables and non-negotiables. There are certain things in scripture that are non-negotiable. In other words, to fall, be a follower of Christ, a, a genuine uh, follower of Jesus, the, his teaching, you know, we cannot say, for example, well, there's more than one way to get to, get to heaven. Jesus says very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That would be a non-negotiable, right? The way into a relationship with God, the way to receive his forgiveness is through Jesus, through the cross is the only way. And so there are certain things we come across in Scripture that take this non-negotiable, uh, we must take this non-negotiable stance with, but there are others that are negotiable. In other words, some people may have seen my timeline here and been like, wait a second, I'm not so sure about that rapture being there before that time of the tribulation. I think it comes in the middle. While a great number of other Christians say, no, no, I think it comes at the end when Jesus returns and the followers of Christ just kind of do a big U-turn and come back with him. And that's okay. I, I believe that is a negotiable issue. Now, I personally think that the scripture teaches it comes before, but it's not the kind of issue that I'm going to focus all of my attention on, dwell on in such a way that I exclude other followers of Christ from fellowship because of something that's a negotiable issue. And we need to know the difference between those two things. Well, Ed Hinson puts it this way. He said, God's clock, the clock of history, is ticking away. It never speeds up. It never slows down. It just keeps on ticking, continually and relentlessly moving us closer and closer to the end of the age. How close we are to the end will only be revealed by time itself. And I think this is kind of the idea that we need to take, is we need to trust in God and what he has revealed to us, do our best to study and understand and learn these things, but realize that in the end, Jesus' uh, return is known by one person alone, and that's God. Jesus put it this way, but as for that day or hour, no one knows it. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, only the Father. See, in Jesus' time on earth, uh, as, when he was speaking this, only the Father knew this time. Not even the angels in heaven know this date. And so we should not be so um, arrogant to propose we can understand a date that not even the angels in heaven or Jesus, when he was bodily here on the earth, knew. That would be preposterous and ridiculous. So we need to keep this in mind in studying this material. Now, this idea of tracking signs and trying to guess uh, where the, those, those things will end up is nothing foreign to us. You know, we make predictions based on things like hurricane or uh, uh, the weather or in politics to try and understand where we think something may be going based on the best data that we do have. Here is the uh, hurricane, uh, potential hurricane um, trackings for the different tropical storms that have popped up that are going to affect um, our hemisphere. And so this was published back on October 5th, and some of these have come to pass and other ones haven't. But this idea of trying to predict, this, that, that, that's, that part is okay, and, and we're familiar with that. The problem is when we take it too far, and we try to make a statement like the Bible guarantees it. Now, it's, what's interesting about predicting the weather is that this is something that Jesus himself specifically addressed with people in his day. We read in Matthew 16, Now when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Well, Jesus said, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today because the sky is red and darkening. Then he goes on to say, you know how to judge correctly the appearance of the sky, but you cannot evaluate the signs of the times. Now, biblical scholars conservatively will say that there were over 100 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled at his first coming 2,000 years ago. If that's even half true, what Jesus is doing here is correcting or rebuking these religious leaders 
for not studying the scripture, for not studying their word, to know when Jesus would come the first time and to be able to recognize that the Messiah was there with them. We can easily extrapolate this same principle to understanding Jesus' second coming by correctly studying the scripture and evaluating the signs of the times. That brings us to the picture of his return or the description of it. We read in verse 26, Then everyone will see the Son of Man arriving in the clouds with great power and glory. Notice that he says everyone will see. This won't be a secret event. You, every once in a while, you'll, you'll read a story or you'll see some, uh, some show on TV where Jesus like secretly appears in our modern day and people reject him. That's a ridiculous concept uh, in the pages of Scripture. When Jesus returns, he is letting us know clearly that we will all across the world be able to see and know that his return is happening. Matthew tells us, For just like the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. This lightning strike, uh, you know, if you're in a storm and, and, and the lightning's close to you, you're going to see it. Well, Jesus is using this analogy to describe that on a worldwide scale. Some people speculate that his return uh, as he's coming down from the heavens will be like a train Uh, Him and his followers coming down, circling the globe multiple times, maybe over the course of 24 hours before he finally uh, sets foot on the ground. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus himself tells us, Look, he's returning with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes on the earth will mourn because of him. This will certainly come to pass. That's right. John is receiving this revelation from Jesus And he's reminding us, yeah, every eye will see him when this happens. And we can be certain this will come to pass. That brings us to the place of his return. Where will Jesus actually come back to? We know know it's going to be the earth. But is any more detail given about the actual landing spot of his return? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. If we look back to Acts chapter 1... Shortly after Jesus had ascended into heaven, spoken his last words to his disciples, and he raises up into the air, his disciples are kind of standing around in Jerusalem, and they're just watching him ascend up into the clouds. And then we read, as they were still staring into the sky while he was going, suddenly two men in white clothing stood near them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you saw him going into heaven. And so these two men in white, these these are angels that God had sent to kind of shake up his disciples who were maybe would have just stood there staring up into the sky until they fell over dead. And he said, listen, don't don't sit here staring and you've got work to do. And don't worry, when he comes back, he's going to descend back here to Jerusalem in the same way that you saw him leave. In other words, visibly, physically, literally. We read, for example, in Zechariah 14, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in half, east to west, leaving a great valley. Half the mountain will move northward and the other half southward. His feet will physically stand on the ground. Jesus' return will will, will be very much a physical, literal return. And so let's not forget the literal, physical, visible, and personal element to his return. This won't be just like he comes back into my heart or uh, he'll be working through this. He's going to actually be coming back here. Here's an interesting detail Zachariah gives us. The Mount of Olives will be split in half. Uh, And so this will be like a kind of a a shaking return. I mean, it won't be like, you know, he'll just gently come and rest his feet down on the ground. I mean, it's going to create an earthquake. It's going to be very noticeable there in and around the Jerusalem area. This is a picture of the Mount of Olives as it looks today. There's, uh, you know, not a whole lot on the mound. It's, uh, you've got some buildings and um, over on one side, you have a very large Jewish cemetery. It's not really uh, heavily populated, from my understanding, but there is a hotel there, the Mount of Olives Hotel. 
Uh, someday I'd love to be able to stay there. Apparently has some of the best views looking out from the Mount of Olives over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It's been there for some time. We read actually uh, a story about this from Dwight Pentecost, Bible teacher. He says a large hotel chain in the late 1950s tried to build here. But after geological studies were done, they were told that it was a poor site to build on because a fault line ran under the mountain and it would be extremely risky to build there. Well, later in 1960, a hotel was actually built on this site, that Mount of Olives Hotel. He says, when I stayed there, I asked the front desk manager when I was checking in if they had good earthquake insurance, but the man had no idea what I was talking about. I'm sure that was pretty funny for Dwight Pentecost at the time. That brings us to the people, the people that will come or accompany Jesus with his return. In Zechariah 14, we're given this detail. Then the Lord my God will come with all his holy ones with him. And so this idea of a train coming down with Jesus at the, at the front as, as the engine and, and this long procession of people coming with him, yeah, that's, that seems to be pretty accurate. Matthew tells us that when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels will be with him. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. So not only will these, the holy ones referring to, could be angels, could be uh, believers in Christ who have been resurrected with Jesus. Well, we know at least the angels are, but when Jesus comes down, he's going to sit on his glorious throne, showing his right to rule, his sovereignty, his physical kind of legislation over the world as he sets things right. In 1 Thessalonians 3, Paul tells us, so that your hearts are strengthened in holiness to be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Saints, this is a, a Bible word for a follower of Jesus, a believer in Jesus. And so we know that for those of us who are followers of Jesus, who have received Christ into our hearts, who have received the forgiveness that he offers through the cross, we will have the opportunity to return with him on this incredible day. Revelation 19 puts it this way. Revelation 19 really is the primary New Testament passage on this second coming of Christ. And we read that the armies that are in heaven, dressed in white, and the context you're referring to these believers in Jesus who have been cleansed, they're you know, dressed in white meaning, you know, it's describing how they've been uh, cured and cleansed uh, by Jesus' forgiveness. Clean, fine linen were following him on white horses. And so you can just imagine this dramatic procession down from the, from the skies. His, the clouds are like a chariot around him riding in on white horses. It's an incredible uh, you know, thing to imagine. And that brings us to the purpose of his return. Now, I want to speak more to this idea of the purpose and how that should directly affect our lives next week when we read some more of Jesus' words about this at the end of chapter 13. But I thought for way of completion, since we're talking about the second coming now, it's important to understand the purpose of why he's coming back. And so I want to look at this briefly in our time remaining. We read in verse 27 of Mark 13, Then he will send angels, and they will gather his elect from the four, from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. In other words, collecting God's people and bringing them into safety to be with him. In Luke's account, we read, but when these things begin to happen, Jesus tells us, stand up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And so one of the main purposes of Jesus' return is to redeem his people, to fulfill his many promises going all the way back to the time of Abraham. When, Jesus, or when God promised Abraham that he would turn him into a great nation, that he would bless him, he would bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him, that he would give him his land and his inheritance. In this day, Jesus will answer that promise finally and completely and totally. And the redemption, not only for the Jewish nation and for followers, but all, for all followers of Christ, Jesus says that day will be drawing near. In Zechariah chapter 12, we read that on that day, the Lord himself will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the weakest among them will be mighty like David and the dynasty of David will be like God 
the angel of the Lord before them. And so Jesus is coming back. He's going to defend uh, his followers in this day. He's going to be the one out in front fighting for them. In chapter 14, we read, Then the Lord himself will go to battle and will fight against those nations just as he fought battles in ancient days. The Lord himself going out into battle. The Lord himself defending his people. In chapter 14 later, we read that the Lord will then be king over all the earth. And that day, the Lord will be seen as one with a single name. And people will settle there. And there will be no longer any threat of divine extermination. Jerusalem will dwell in security. And so as Jesus comes back to provide security uh, 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 and redemption for his people, he will also establish his kingdom where he will reign over uh, the world to bring peace and prosperity to all people everywhere the king will return. And so these are some of the uh, kind of the the raw purposes that Jesus is coming back for to fulfill his promise, to bring security and safety, to judge rightly, to bring in true justice, and to let his love reign over the earth. In Revelation 19, we see John's description. He says, then I saw heaven opened and here a white horse The one riding it was called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and goes to war. His eyes are like a fiery flame, and there are many diadem crowns on his head. Jesus coming out to to bring justice finally and truthfully and, and, and purposely, personally, to this world. Dwight Pentecost adds this interesting detail. He says, a short time ago I took occasion to go through the New Testament to mark each reference to the coming of the Lord Jesus and to observe the use made of that teaching about his coming. He says, I was struck anew with the fact that almost without exception, when the coming of Christ is mentioned in the New Testament, it is followed by an exhortation to godliness and holy living. In other words, to follow Christ, to give him everything you've got. He goes on, he says, while we study, uh, while the study of prophecy will give us proof of the authority of the Word of God, it will also reveal the purpose of God and the power of God and will give us the peace and assurance of God. We have missed the whole purpose of the study of prophecy if it does not conform to the Lord Jesus Christ in our daily living. And so this should affect us deeply in our core to know that God will come back, that Jesus will return physically to answer his promises, to redeem his people, to bring peace and justice to the world. Well, I'd like to leave you with this. One of the very last verses in the Bible, the very end of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me to pay each one according to what he has done. Jesus wants to come to give you a reward. The question I'll leave you with is this. Are you in a place to accept this reward from Jesus? Have you welcomed him into your heart so that you know you're on the winning side and that you know that Jesus will fight for you? And so I would ask you to seek the reward that can come only from Christ, eternity and forgiveness that can come only from him. Well, that's all we have here in our study today. I'd like to offer you a book if you're interested in reading more about the Bible, learning a little bit more about some of these details. You can click on the link in the description to pick that up. We'll send it to you free of charge. For those of you who are meeting in groups, you'd like to discuss some of these things, or if you'd just like to personally reflect on some of the things we've covered, you can pause the video at this point and go through some of the questions that I've brought up. Why don't I close this down in a little prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you have promised to fulfill all of your promises, that you are dedicated to redeeming your people, to rescuing us, to showering us with your love and your forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that we would look forward with great hope and anticipation to this blessed day where you will come back and set all things right. And I thank you, God, that you have offered that forgiveness to all of us so that we can seek that reward that comes only from you. 
I pray that anybody who might be interested in that would turn to you in their heart tonight and receive that forgiveness that you can only offer through your cross. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen.